you are in for a treat in this conversation with John Bailey, the director of the University of California, Hopland and Extension Research Center. We lean into and dive into the benefits of hedgerows. What are they? Why would you want to plant them? How do you plant one successfully? And where would you use one? Would you use one in your backyard? The answer is yes. Tune into the interview to find out. You can even use them on 100 acre parcels and in ranching. Who knew? They could even replace a fence. I'm Natalie Forsbauer, founder and editor-in-chief of Heart and Soil Magazine, the guide for regenerative farming, gardening, and living so that we can have a healthy planet, healthy food, and healthy people for years to come. If you have not grabbed your subscription yet, hop on over to heartandsoilmagazine.com and grab yours for just $39.99 a year. It helps us come together in community and provide these amazing interviews for you. And it helps amplify the conversation of regeneration. Thanks for tuning into this interview. If you like it, be sure to like it and subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends. It helps more and more people see it. Enjoy this conversation with John Bailey about hedgerows. John, welcome to this conversation. I'm deeply grateful for you joining me today. Thank you, Natalie, for having me. I appreciate being here. Yeah, it's my honor, actually. Uh, John, before we jump into the conversation about hedgerows, tell us about the UC Hopland Research and Extension Center. Who are you and what do you do? What are you all about? So um, we're one of nine research and extension centers that the University of California has spread across the state, um, each kind of focusing on their regional and local issues in agriculture and natural resources. So here at Hopland, we're located in Mendocino County. We have about 5,400 acres of diverse uh, landscape, and we really uh, offer the potential for researchers from across the UC system in a variety of fields to conduct their studies here. Um, and we have staff and facilities and equipment to support that and conduct their research. And then we also do educational programs um, aimed at everybody from kindergartners, introducing them to lambs and animal husbandry, up through high school, introducing people to fire science. Uh, and then we host classes for like Humboldt State and UC Berkeley that want to do field classes here. So we, we really are focusing on um, uh, rangeland ecology, wildlife ecology, fire science, various aspects of climate change related to soil ecology, carbon sequestration, uh, and uh, oak ecology as well. So that's really fascinating. I'm wondering what your focus of research is on. What are you really looking to discover and what, are, what questions of curiosity and wonder are you sitting in? Well, I mean, I guess some of it is driven by the individual researchers who come here. So they're coming with their projects. Um, really, we're focusing on sustainable natural ecosystems and working landscapes. So uh, there's a whole diversity of issues around those big topic areas. Um, climate change is definitely at the forefront of our minds uh, in terms of adaptation to resilience for and, um, and potential ways to mitigate it. Um, so everything from how can we increase carbon sequestration in the soils? Um, how do our oak woodlands respond to fire and how can we potentially help them regenerate after uh, fire events, which have become more extreme? Uh, what are the effects of um, things like increasing cannabis cultivation in wildland areas or um, legacy fences, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of miles across the West? And how can we tweak those to uh, work better with the existing wildlife? Um, how can we have livestock operations operate in areas where there's predators? without having to resort to lethal methods of control as have been done in the past and are practiced a lot. So I mean, that's it's pretty broad scope. Um, and then I think an, another huge important uh, focus that we have is really introducing our youth and our communities to agriculture and natural resources because our world is becoming increasingly urbanized and digitized so that even people who grow up in a town that's surrounded by agricultural land and forest they don't have any relation to it. And so we're really trying to 
um, do the science to learn more about those natural and agricultural ecosystems, but then also form the, the human connections to and the care about them. Wow, that's really powerful, really powerful work. And I love how you're um, not just looking at how to mitigate climate change, but also how do we work with what is, what is emerging, where we are at, and, and how can we also connect the communities more deeply to their farming communities that they're surrounded in and with and sitting with and growing with. It's really powerful work. Yeah, and it's difficult because, I mean, there's a lot of um, different cultural ideas about how to use and manage our ecosystems. Um, there's huge political divides in our country. Um, so it's not necessarily an easy conversation to be part of, but it's definitely important work. It's really important work. And if I may ask, and um, I ask this with a lot of tenderness and a lot of uh, sacredness, and I don't need an answer of um, what you do. Um, uh, what I'm really wondering is how do you hold the space? How do you hold the space for all the voices to be heard and for all the learnings to come in? Um, I think it requires a lot of intention to really deeply listen to different viewpoints and try to understand where people are coming from. Because um, on the one hand, if you're an agricultural producer, your livelihood is dependent on the land that you work on. And um, there's a lot of traditions in agriculture which are really important to both the people that work directly in the field and to our overall culture in general. Um, and then at the same time, there's a um, increasingly known impact that humans are having in really dramatic ways on the natural world. And that can come into conflict with economic value production. So they're, they're very different um, value sets and places that people are coming from. And there's no easy answers, but if you don't listen, you can't really understand what that person's viewpoint is. And then you can't easily speak to the benefits or the difficulties that they're having. So I think that's, that's core is just that intention to listen and then the will to try to communicate um, back and forth between those different viewpoints. Deep listening and intentional conversations. That's really powerful. Thank you for holding that space for all of us to learn from. We deeply appreciate well, that. I'm not a pro, but I try. <laughs> well, and that's just it though. Imagine if we all showed up like that for each other in, in what we're learning and discovering, you know, it opens up, it opens up hearts and doors. So you, I appreciate you. Um, let's jump, jump into uh, what's bringing us together. Another piece of what's bringing us together, which is hedger, hedgerows. And uh, from my, what I understand, you're doing a lot of research and discovery in, in hedgerows and the impact that they're having on the environment. And on the soil. And so I'm curious, how would you describe a hedgerow to begin with? What is a hedgerow and what does it mean to have or plant a hedgerow? Well, it's, a, it's an age old practice that people have been using for thousands of years across the world. And really it's intentionally chosen and planted species of plants that um, you're usually putting in a row <laughs> as the name implies. Um, at the edge of a field or at an area where you're trying to create different functionality. Um, and they can be used for everything from physical barriers to prevent livestock movement um, or screen for privacy, reduce dust and wind uh, concerns, prevent soil erosion from water or wind. Uh, and then they also can be used for a lot of the functions inherent in the plants that you choose. So, um, you know, deciding to choose plants that are adapted to your local area so that you can then um, take advantage of the evolution that's happened between those plants and for example, pollinator species. Um, and so you can choose plants that have um, good floral resources for pollinators and for birds um, and that produce good fruit. Uh, also for different wildlife species. You can choose plants that um, have dye qualities. So, you know, for example, one of the plants we use is coffee berry, and you can use that as a natural dye and fabric. Um, mm -hmm. You can also choose plants that have a, a harvestable 
cash crops. So some of the plants that we have put in are elderberries, which have a medicinal quality and people harvest them for that purpose. So it, it really kind of depends on what you want to do uh, and which plants you choose for that. But in general, it's chosen plants in a row. <laughs> I love it. Chosen plants in a row. That's really powerful because um, the opportunity to diversify a farm or to diversify your food source on your farm, whether it's for yourself or your the customers or the communities that you serve is there as well. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think that's one of the important things to take into account when you're designing a hedgerow mm -hmm. is really what are those benefits that you're seeking um, you know, and also what are the costs? Because you could accidentally set up better habitat for predator species that affect your livestock or that house pests that affect your cropland nearby. So that um, careful choosing of the plant type is an important um, design criteria. And then same thing with the placement of the, of the hedgerow, you know, knowing what your climate is, knowing what the prevailing wind direction is, um, you know, where the water's going to flow. Those are all important things to consider. Oh, I love how you presence those pieces because I, I'm in Saskatchewan. And I remember when I first moved out to Saskatchewan in 2003, and we were looking at hedgerows and um, a really popular hedgerow is here is caragannids is because they uh, get really bushy, they block the wind and they grow very quickly in this climate. And so uh, how does a person find out what type of hedgerow would work well for what they want to do? Well, um, it's different in Canada, but I assume similar in that there's a lot of um, government agencies who have done a lot of work to craft uh, habitat conservation programs. And as part of that have compiled plant lists that work in your area. So down here in the US, the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service um, has guides around designing hedgerows. Um, mm -hmm. So does the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And then there's nonprofit organizations like here in California, the Wild Farm Alliance has really done a lot of work with um, designing hedgerows around agriculture. Um, the Xerxes Society uh, also has done work on hedgerows related to benefits for pollinators in particular. And, and then depending on your area, there's often native plant societies, like here in California, there's the California Native Plant Society, who also offers resources around choosing what type of plants are going to work best in your area. So, you know, I think a, a Google search going to your local um, nurseries can be another way to find that information. But if you have an agricultural service provider from a government or a non governmental organization in your area, they can be a good place to start. And if they don't have that information, they can often easily refer you to somebody who does. Oh, that's great information. Thank you. Yeah, here in Saskatchewan, we do have some hedro, um, uh, I guess, services that we can find out what to grow. And what beyond that, I'm curious about, you know, if I have a farm, how do I, how do I decide what the hedgerow is? And you talked about a little bit about where to plant a hedgerow and the questions to ask when we're planting a hedgerow. And at the same time, um, I'm wondering, firstly, how much mindfulness needs to go into planting a hedgerow? So separate from the design phase, you know, once you get into the actual planting, I think um, you mentioned the agricultural uses, you know, referring to existing farmers in your area who have hedgerows is going to be a, a great resource because they're really going to know what actually works and what doesn't. Um, so don't disregard that interpersonal contact of seeing a hedgerow, finding out whose farm it is and saying, hey, I really like your hedgerow. How did you do it? Um, mm -hmm. on, on our end, one of the big considerations, a couple of them are, um, do we have water available in that area to irrigate? Um, because even if you're using drought tolerant natives, having some supplemental irrigation for the first couple of years at least is really gonna help your hedgerow get established more quickly and reduce your uh, replacement costs. Because mm -hmm. you know if it just goes into drought the next year and you don't have irrigation water, your whole hedgerow could die because they are drought adapted, but it doesn't mean they're drought proof. So water availability is a key part um, mm -hmm. and choosing a place where you either have existing water or you're able to provide it easily. Um, and then really trying to 
minimize your your labor and maintenance. And so, like for example, what we did is we didn't till the ground beforehand because we didn't want to incorporate a new weed seed bank. Um, instead, we cut individual holes. And here we have a, a skid steer with a post hole digger attachment, which is really useful, but you can do it with a, a hand shovel as well. Um, and then mulching is going to be really key and ideally drip irrigation because both of those things are going to reduce your mowing and hand weeding cost. So like what we did is um, we laid down a sheet of corrugated cardboard and you can use recycled cardboard um, or weed barrier cloth. I tend to shy away from the weed barrier cloth because it's got plastic in it. Um, but that's a standard agricultural practice because it, it lasts longer than cardboard which biodegrades. So anyway, you lay down that sheet mulch and then cut your holes into that for the plants. And then that way you have a contiguous barrier to block the weeds from coming up from the soil for the first couple of years. Um, if you're using recycled sheets of cardboard, make sure you're overlapping them by six to eight inches so you don't create accidental spaces. Um, and then uh, laying down compost or wood chips as a mulch on top of that keeps the cardboard down on the ground and then also um, reduces your water uh, evaporation from the soil surface. So it'll, it'll increase your water use efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. Drip irrigation can seem like it's expensive up front, but by only applying the water to your plant roots, you're both saving that water cost and you're not accidentally germinating other weed seeds to compete. Um, and then if you can plant in an area where you're able to mm -hmm. mow down the sides of your hedgerow, that's going to be a lot easier than if you're somewhere where you've got other vegetation and you can't get a mower through. Because you, what you really want to do is help protect those baby plants for the first couple of years to give them a chance to get a jump start on any competition. Hmm. I love what you said about using compost around the hedgerows. That's really, that's a really good tip. And um, like the cardboard with the compost and wood chips on top. Would you suggest to put compost into the uh, hole that you're planting the hedgerow in as well? I would in general. I mean, it, most plant species are going to do okay with compost and it's gonna help them. Um, mm -hmm. When you're in your design phase, just check because there are certain types of plants uh, that don't like nutrition and you know, they don't like excess nutrition mm -hmm. around their roots and it can cause disease problems. Um, so like if you're choosing plants that are from an arid area that only grow in infertile rocky soils, you probably don't want to put compost in. Um, but a lot of other plants can thrive from that. Um, and then one other thing I, I forgot to mention uh, is when you plant, you don't want to plant your plants into a depression because then what happens is the water will pool in there and you're gonna get crown rot. And so if you can plant, you're gonna to wanna to plant a little bit higher than the soil surface. So your root crown is above the soil. Also, because when you dig, you loosen that soil underneath. And so your plant, even though you plant it up high, is gonna sink down a little bit. So if you plant level, it's gonna sink below. You just so you wanna make sure your root crown is up high. And then most plants, you don't want to irrigate directly on the root crown. So put your drip emitter off to the side because too much moisture on that root crown can again um, cause disease and die back. Good tips, thank you. Thank you for those. I'm curious, um, how did you get interested in hedgerows? Um, so way back when I first finished my undergraduate degree, I worked in agroecology for a couple of years and it was on um, trying to convert strawberries and cotton to organic. Uh, you know, strawberries are one of the heaviest pesticide use crops. And mm -hmm. so what the researcher I was working for was really looking at is um, two different types of hedgerows, some along the sides of the fields with like woody perennials that you would leave there year after year, and then some annual hedgerows that went into the field. So, you know, taking out a row of strawberries and putting in a mix of different, um, in this case, mostly beneficial pollinator and predator insect favoring plants. So that kind of like was my introduction to, oh, wow, you really can use these plants in agricultural situations, not just for like aesthetic beauty or biodiversity, which are their own concerns, but also to help with production issues. That's amazing. So what did you plant between the strawberry rows? 
Uh, we were planting, uh, it was quite a bit of mustards, uh, alyssum, uh, some types of clovers. Um, that's my recollection. It's you know been a quite a while, but um, I definitely know those species were important because they provide good floral uh, resources for uh, a, a variety of pollinator species, but also a lot of um, beneficial insects. They will eat um, like pest species at a certain life stage, like ladybugs will eat other insects when they're in the, the larval stage or the nymph stage. But then when they get to be an adult, they need floral resources to survive on. So um, mm. it, it helps bring in those beneficial insects give food for the adults and then they can lay their eggs and produce a second generation. Man, John, this is amazing. So is that, that type of intercropping that you're talking about, is that agroecology? Would that be fall under that umbrella as well? Yeah, exactly. Really? Oh, that's really cool. And so hedgerows is part of agroecology. Right. Well, and it's interesting because it's, it's one of those practices that existed before there was even the term agroecology. Um, yeah. and it was just, you know, farmers observing what was going on and figuring out ways to work better with their landscapes. But um, yeah, it's definitely a, an agroecological practice. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the small farmer, and um, it's probably pretty simple to incorporate a hedgerow or two into their farming practices. But what happens if a person is farming thousands of acres? Where would a hedgerow fit in in those circumstances, or even you know a hundred acre uh, farm? Um, in general, people would put that at the field edges. So you might choose an area that has more marginal soils, or has poor drainage, or is beside an irrigation canal or a roadside where you know you you might have compaction problems. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, it's at the field edges. So most farmers would choose to keep their most productive soils, keep their fields contiguous and not break them up, and then run the hedgerow down the side or choose an area that's a little bit more marginal for agricultural value. Mm. Um, and, and then, you know, if you're, if you're in any kind of agricultural setting, labor efficiency and mechanization are always key aspects. So choosing an area, like I said, where you can mow around it or you can use equipment to help you plant it, um, is going to really help you with your upfront costs and your maintenance. So John, what are some of the specific benefits of using hedgerows? Well, so um, biodiversity, or the, well, there's, there's different sides of the coin. So there's agricultural values and then there's ecosystem values. And sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. So on mm -hmm. the agricultural value side, um, you know, you can be protecting your crops or your livestock from prevailing winds, uh, reducing soil erosion due to those winds. You can be slowing down the, um, the movement of water across your landscape to reduce erosion. You can be um, creating uh, beneficial insect habitat that can then help you with uh, pest pressures in your, in your field. Uh, you could be putting in a, a hedgerow that blocks people from easily getting into your operation. Um, those are some of the agricultural values. Well, and you can also plant plants that have uh, a valuable crop. I mean, I, I mentioned elderberries, but um, there's plenty of other examples out there. Um, so those are on the agricultural side. And then the ecosystem side, you're really increasing your biodiversity. So um, providing more habitat for birds, whether they're migratory or, or native to your area. Um, you can also be improving the water quality that's running off your farm into nearby riparian areas. Um, you can be planting along your riparian area to really increase the riparian habitat zone. Um, and uh, then one of the reasons that our program here is funded by the California Department of Food and Agriculture Healthy Soils Program is one of their goals is really to increase carbon sequestration in soils. And by planting perennials, which get much larger than the annuals, and that are there for multiple years, you're helping increase carbon sequestration in soils because the plants are continually drawing CO2 from the atmosphere, then using sunlight and water and photosynthetic reactions and making it into sugars. And then those sugars are going down the roots into the soil. And then we've been learning in the last couple of decades particularly that those plants are then sharing those sugars out into the soil. So 
around their roots, they're passing the sugars out into the diverse soil life, which then helps stimulate the ecology of the soil, which then further helps sequester carbon. So um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of benefits on both sides. That's amazing. And, and thank you for mentoring, mentioning the sequestration of carbon, because that is something that is um, maybe not new to some and new to many. And we're seeing and hearing those words a lot. And I'm wondering, just out of curiosity, when did you first um, have the light bulb moment that the way we, um, or, or the, I guess, when did you most, when did you first have that light bulb moment that plants and soil and what's happening ecologically could actually sequester carbon? Um, you know, I think it's probably uh, really when I started coming into the UC system, you know, I'd worked in agriculture and private industry before coming here, but um, there wasn't as much mention about that. And also the science has been rapidly evolving. So as I got into the UC system and started working with a diversity of researchers, um, started really learning about how much that, that carbon is really taken from the atmosphere and spread down into the soils and can remain there for a, a long period of time. I mean, it depends on your soil type. And I mean, there's always complexities in, in ecosystems, but um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see how there's that lag time in the pipeline between what's a theory out there that we think we know and then it becomes known as scientifically valid. And then it passes into like the, the innovation phase where certain people will adopt it, but then it has to get mm -hmm. widespread and, and more mainstream. And so that's where you know, programs like this Healthy Soils program are really all about that, where they're, you know, we hear so much about bad government and inefficient government, but this is like an example of you know, using government funding and, and power to help spread a beneficial product process that we may not have known all the benefits about, but now that we do, we've got to get people to know about it and use it. So that's, mm. that's what this project is really all about. And I appreciate having the chance to talk about it here. Oh, thanks, John. Well, I'm excited to amplify this, this uh, part of your story and journey. Um, so whereabouts are we in that map that you just walked us through to from theory to um, it being a wide um, accepted and practiced concept? Whereabouts are we on that journey with this discovery of carbon um, sequestry? I would say we're kind of coming out of a valley because there was a lot of work done on hedgerows, especially around the biodiversity and the beneficial um, insect side of the picture for agriculture in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and, and then there was like a food safety incident where a, a bunch of people uh, died from E. coli from um, eating fresh salad greens. And the, the culprit right immediately was pointed out of like, well, we got to get rid of these hedgerows. That's where the pest species came from. It was later determined that it was actually wild pigs that broke into the, to the property. And it was through their contamination of the field, not an effect of the hedgerow, but we had a huge number of hedgerows actually torn out because there was a food safety concern and it was not legitimate, but you know, a lot of times there's an emotional reaction after something bad happens. Um, and so now the carbon sequestration value is becoming more known and we've kind of gotten over that initial reaction of, oh, it was the hedgerow fault. Um, and so we're, I think we're starting to see a, a second wave of adoption of hedgerows in the, in the US here. Mm, wow, that's a really powerful story. I think it's worldwide that we're experiencing that. And um, I'm really excited to share the work that you're doing in California. What was that feeling like when you first discovered the impact of the work that you were stepping into and doing? I think it was just kind of a, uh, how would I describe it? It's like the validation of something that you've known is worthwhile for a while and then seeing that it's becoming more accepted and known that there's value to other people in it you know so it, it was a little bit of like inspiring of like I knew it wasn't a good idea or I knew it was a good idea and and to uh have that validated is definitely um, a worthwhile feeling to get it once in a while 
That's really exciting. Well, I'm deeply thankful for the work that you're doing, the research that you're sharing, and um, you're speaking at the Eco Conference, at Eco Farm Conference. I know a lot of people are looking excited, are looking forward to, and excited about your session. So thank you for taking the time with me here today to share a little bit of about what you're learning. And I'm wondering if there's anything else that you just wanted to add on here that we haven't covered today. Um, I guess I, I, in a lot of the examples I mentioned, um, like cropland, but mm -hmm. you know, this, this project is specifically about rangeland as well, because a lot of times rangeland operators may not be plant people. And so they might not even be exposed to the possibility of hedgerows. And there's not mm -hmm. a, a very strong tradition in this country of using hedgerows for animal agriculture, um, mm -hmm. where there is in other parts of the world. And so I, I just want to make sure that that's a known part of this, this project and that it's a practice that can be used not just on good flat agricultural soils that are used for plants, but that you can plant it, like in our case, on Northern California unirrigated rangelands and still see a lot of those benefits. Your, your plant selections will be different, you know, you, and you're going to want to decide on what you're looking for, but it gets really hot here in the summer. Hedgerows can provide shade. You can choose plant species that have good ecosystem benefits, but maybe are thorny and you plant them densely. So instead of having to put in a fence, you put in a hedgerow to block your plant, your, um, your livestock from moving. So there's a, a whole wide range of uses for, for um, hedgerows. That's awesome. Can I ask you a couple more questions about that? Sure. Okay. One is when you, you've mentioned a couple of times using a hedgerow in place of a fence. So what type of hedgerow could we plant in place of a fence? Well, I mean, down here, um, we have this uh, plant called white thorn and it's like its name has these huge spiky thorns on it. So you can plant those densely and it will form a solid barrier that the, that the livestock can't get through. Uh, it really depends on your region, but you know there's a lot of um, different types of particularly thorny plants that discourage animals from both eating them, but also from trying to push through them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then in, in that case, you're going to really want to, uh, when you're designing a hedgerow, you want to look at how big the plants are going to get mm -hmm. so that you space them appropriately. But if you're wanting to form a physical barrier, you're going to want to crowd them so that they, mm -hmm. they really interweave their branches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how long would it take something like that to grow? So let's see, we are in our second year and the white thorn plants are about three feet high already planted from one gallon. So, you know, you're probably going to, yeah, yeah. So there, you know, you, but you probably need a couple, three years at least to get a good established hedgerow. You might want to wait a little bit longer. Um, so, you know, that's one of those design considerations. Do you fence it when you plant it, which we did? Do you mm -hmm. do a temporary fence or a permanent fence? I mean, there's there's a lot of different decisions to make, but um, it's it's amazing the diversity of plants that are out there. And then also the resources to help you. you you're not alone. I mean, a lot of other people have done this work. So the internet's an amazing thing, the non-governmental agencies that work in this, and then the, the agricultural offices too. Oh, that's really cool. I also was thinking of as a farmer who's ran cattle, uh, I was thinking about those fences that you know you're going to have to replace in three or four years. <laughs> so planting a hedgerow then knowing um, that that might be coming up that you're needing to reassess. So to, yeah, that's really cool. I love that. And uh, one other piece is I'm wondering um, about the about garden gardeners, let's just like the urban gardener. Uh, what benefit, like, would I want to plant um, any type of hedgerow in my yard? Would that be beneficial? And if so, what types of species might I think about planting? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you can create like a butterfly and bee garden where you're encouraging natural pollinators and they need all the help they can get. I mean, you know, there's real, real serious concerns about the monarch butterfly species becoming extinct. And so you can plant species that are, you know, like milkweed that are specifically targeted at um, populations that are threatened. Um, and then you can also plant around what you want to get. So you can plant fruiting species. I mean, you can use pineapple guavas, you can plant strawberry trees, you can um, plant traditional orchard trees, and then through pruning, espalier them to create a hedgerow. So um, 
in that case, there's a lot of work that's been done, particularly by permaculturalists, looking at what type of species work well together. So there's, there's this term guilds, which are um, groups of plants from different species that complement one another. So you might have a legume that's producing nitrogen next to a plant that needs an extra heavy nitrogen um, load in the soil. Uh, you might have plants that are taller that then a vine can climb up or that you have an understory plant. So there's a lot of great work that's been done um, looking at garden scale hedgerows for a variety of purposes. Man, I love this because a lot of the times when we think about a hedgerow, we think of a row of lilacs or a row of uh, carraganas or a row of, you know, evergreens. So we are, this is, um, I think, really expanding our mindset because it can be, like you said, um, a row of pollinators for monarch butterflies. That's incredible. Right, right. And you don't want to plant those where your sheep are going to graze them because they're toxic. <laughs> to sheep. So that's where, you know, the design phase is important. Take your winter months, you know, to, to plan it out <laughs> and get it right. Um, and for I don't know how it is up there in Saskatchewan. It's much colder. And so down here in California, it's best to plant your hedgerow in the fall because mm -hmm. then the, the plants get a chance for their roots to get used to the soil and to get kind of acculturated to their place before the hot, dry summer months come. Mm -hmm. Maybe up where you're at, it's springtime planting is better because it's so cold over winter, it just decimates the plants. But um, mm -hmm. that's where that local knowledge, talking to your local farmers and gardeners is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And in summary, John, if you could tell somebody uh, three, three really important pieces to keep in mind when they're creating or plan planning their hedgerows, what would those three things be? Um, plan it to be as labor efficient as you can, because mm -hmm. it can be hard to get back to do the work if, if you don't do it right from the start. Um, so that's that mulching and making sure you can mow around it, but plan for that maintenance, really decide what you want your hedgerow to do before you start picking plants. So making kind of a, a list of, okay, these are the three things I want to accomplish mm -hmm. because then you won't get overwhelmed by all the plants that are out there. You can say, well, does it do that? No, it doesn't. Okay. I'm going to pick that other one. Um, and then making sure that your site is chosen well and appropriately for what you want to do. Um, so, you know, design around maintenance, design around what your functions are that you want, and then choose your site appropriately. Awesome. Thank you so much. Those are really good tips. I've learned a lot in this conversation and I can't wait to share it with our community. So thank you so much for your time, John. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, no problem. Grateful you joined us for that conversation and interview. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com. Click on that subscribe button and join us for just $39.99 a year. You make yourself an amazing day and I'm really grateful you're part of our community.